Now let's talk about targeted temperature management, shortened down to TTM. The latest national guidelines update for CPR and ECC recommends that targeted temperature management interventions be administered to comatose, which means lacking meaningful response to verbal commands, adult patients with ROSC after cardiac arrest by selecting and maintaining a constant temperature somewhere between 32 degrees Celsius and 36 degrees Celsius, which would translate to be 89.6 degrees Fahrenheit and 95.2 degrees Fahrenheit for at least 24 hours. Secondly, hemodynamic and ventilation optimization is the next intervention post-arrest. Though ACLS providers often use 100% oxygen while they're performing the initial resuscitation, they should titrate inspired oxygen during the post-cardiac arrest phase to the lowest level required to achieve an arterial oxygen saturation of 92% whenever possible. Now, doing this may help to prevent any potential complications associated with oxygen toxicity. Remember, excessive ventilation with high oxygen levels can actually have adverse hemodynamic effects, especially when intrathoracic pressures are increased and because of the potential decreases in cerebral blood flow when a partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood, which would be abbreviated as PaCO2, decreases. It's so important that healthcare providers start ventilation rates at that 10 per minute. The goal is to achieve normocarbia, which is a partial pressure of end tidal carbon dioxide, or PET-CO2, of 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury, or a PaCO2 of 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury, and may be a reasonable goal unless patient factors prompt more individualized treatments. Other PaCO2 targets may be tolerated for specific patients. For example, a higher PaCO2 may be more appropriate in patients with an acute lung injury or high airway pressures. Likewise, mild hypocapnia might be beneficial treatment as a temporary measure when treating cerebral edema, but hyperventilation could cause cerebral vasoconstriction. Providers should note that when a patient's temperature is below normal, laboratory values reported for PaCO2 might be higher than the actual values. In addition, healthcare professionals should titrate fluid administration and vasoactive or inotropic agents as needed to optimize blood pressure, cardiac output, and systemic perfusion. Now, though the optimal post-cardiac arrest blood pressure remains unknown, a mean arterial pressure of 65 millimeters of mercury or greater is a reasonable goal per scientific studies and current guidelines. When treating for ROSC in patients where coronary artery occlusion is suspected, rescuers should transport the patient to a capable and reliable facility known for providing coronary reperfusion, otherwise known as PCI, and other goal-directed post-cardiac arrest care therapies. The decision to perform PCI can be made irrespective of the presence of coma or the decision to induce hypothermia because concurrent PCI and hypothermia are feasible and safe and have reported good outcomes. Next, we're going to look at glycemic control. Altering glucose concentration within a lower range of 80 to 110 should not be attempted because of the increased risk of hypoglycemia. The latest guidelines update for CPR and ECC does not really have a recommended specific target range of glucose management in adult patients with return of spontaneous circulation after cardiac arrest. Okay, so now let's talk about the neurological and prognostication part of return of spontaneous circulation. See, the American Heart Association guidelines have established the following that the goal of post-cardiac arrest management is to return patients to their pre-arrest functional levels. Reliable early prognostication of neurological outcome is an essential component of post-cardiac arrest care, but the optimal timing is important to consider. In patients treated with TTM, prognostication using clinical examination should be delayed for at least 72 hours after the return of normal thermia. For those not treated with TTM, the earliest time is 72 hours after cardiac arrest and potentially longer if the residual effect of sedation or paralysis confounds the clinical examination.